Good morning, church. Good morning. Praise God. He is an awesome God, and he has blessed us mightily. Somebody give him praise for what he's already done, what he's already done. We thank you, Lord, for another day. Thank you. Today, we're going to continue the series that Pastor Power established of looking at questions that Jesus asked. Questions that Jesus asked. Today we're coming from Matthew, Matthew uh, chapter 20. We're going to look at verses 29 through 34. Highland Bible study on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. We're going to really look at that first, and we're also going to look at Mark. Mark 10, uh, 43 through 52, and Luke 18, 35 through 43, which talks about the same scripture here. And today also after the sermon, we're really going to have communion together. Amen? Amen. Amen. God has been good to us. Let's look at the Word of God, what He has to say in Matthew, Matthew 20, verses 29 through 34. This is what the New King James Version says. Now as they went out of Jericho, a great multitude followed Him. And behold, two men setting by the road. When they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. Then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet. But they cried out all the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. So Jesus stood still. And called them. And said. What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him. Lord. That our eyes. May be open. So Jesus had compassion. And touched their eyes. And immediately. Their eyes received sight. And they. Followed Jesus. God's word. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this day, this moment, and this time for us to hear from you to see what thus says the Lord. I pray, O oh, Heavenly Father, that I stand in John's shoes, that, Lord, that you will use me as your mouthpiece, that you may speak to your people, that they may hear what thus says the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. Let me give you a little background from two weeks ago from a question that was asked that's very similar to this question. Two weeks ago, Pastor Power preached a sermon from Matthew also, Matthew chapter 9, where two blind men followed Jesus, crying out to him, just like they did here, thy son of David, have mercy on us. I can only imagine that these blind men had heard some of the things that Jesus had done. How he healed the sick. All kinds of sickness he healed. I can imagine they knew that he had the authority to do these things. I can imagine how they heard that he calmed the raging sea and the wind just by speaking. They probably heard that he even raised the dead. Hmm, raised the dead. That he cast out demons. And he, and he even forgave men of their sin. What powerful things that these men had probably heard. They had heard. Maybe that's why they cried out to him. Have mercy on us. They cried out to him. I wonder. I wonder why we don't cry out to God today. Maybe, maybe we don't think we're blind. But these men cry out to God. They were determined to get to get to Jesus. Nothing was going to stop them. In fact, they followed Jesus all around the place. And even when he, he went into the house, they followed him. And when he entered into the house, Jesus said to them, question from two weeks ago. 
Do you believe? Do you believe that I am able to do this? And the two blind men answered him and said, Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And Jesus touched their eyes and he said, Because of your faith, your eyes should be open. And their eyes was open and they could see. Today, Jesus, today Jesus gives us a situation very similar to this. Very similar to this as Two blind men. But there's one thing, there's one thing that grabbed my attention what Pastor Paul said from last week. He said that Jesus told them not to tell anybody. But they told everybody. But now Jesus is telling us to tell everybody. And we won't tell anybody. I like that when Pastor Paul said that. I like that. So, so that's what I'm going to say today, today to you. I want you to treat this sermon as it's top secret and don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody about Jesus and how good and how he healed, how he blessed, how he raised, and how he's coming back. Don't, don't tell anybody. Keep it top secret. And just maybe, just maybe you will tell everybody. Because that's our role, to tell everybody about Jesus Christ. Today, today, the question that's on the table, that Jesus asked these two blind men, what do you, what do you want me to do for you? What an what a interesting question. What do you want me to do for you? Let's look at the scripture. Let's dive right in to the scripture. The scripture says in verse 29. Now. When they went out of Jericho. A great multitude followed them. Here's the event. Look at what's taking place. Jesus. Coming out of Jericho. His disciples. With him. Coming out of Jericho. And a multitude of people. Uh, uh, it says. A, a multitude of people coming out with him. Jericho? Jericho, in flashback, Jericho, as I remember, a city that was so sinful. And matter of fact, it was a city that the Israelites first encountered coming into the promised land. You may know the story. That they marched around the city. And when Jesus commanded them to shout, they shouted, and the walls came falling down. Jericho. Yeah, but when the walls came down, Joshua, their leader, Joshua put a curse on Jericho. Put a curse on Jericho to say, whoever rebuilt Jericho, their first son and their last son would be killed. So no one wants to build Jericho, but no, 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 no. But, but Jericho was rebuilt. And as Jericho's foundation was being laid, the, the first, the, the, the oldest son died. And we'll study this in Bible study. The oldest son died. And when the completion of Jericho and the gates were put in place, then the youngest son died. See, there's one thing. One thing, when God says something, when God says something, it's going to happen. The rebuilding of Jericho took place 500 years after Joshua had put the curse on it. But if God said so, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. So some of you wondering, is Jesus coming back again? Did he say he's coming back? He's coming back again. Therefore, Jesus is coming back again. Understand this. God has the power to rebuild anything that he wants to rebuild. He can build Jericho. He can rebuild our lives. No matter, no matter what we are going through, no matter what we have been through, God has the ability and the authority and the power to rebuild it. 
Here we're going to see that two blind men's lives been rebuilt by believing in God. But one thing you must understand, rebuilding comes at a cost. The man's two sons died a cost to rebuild Jericho. To rebuild our lives, Jesus died on the cross, a perfect sacrifice that our lives may be rebuilt. The price has already been paid. Why not take advantage of it? It's free that your life could be rebuilt. They're coming out of Jericho. Coming out of Jericho, and then it, the scripture says in verse 30, and behold, two blind men sitting by the road. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out saying, have mercy, have mercy on us. O oh Lord, son of David. See, this event, similar to two weeks ago, not the same. Two weeks ago, the blind man was following Jesus. Here, the blind men are sitting at the gate or sitting on the side of the road as Jesus passed by. Now notice, the men were blind. But they could hear. They weren't blind and deaf. They were just blind. See, it's very interesting when I thought about that. They could hear. I, I kind of looked through the scripture. And I don't think I found any scripture that showed that a man was born blind and deaf. I see them blind. I see them deaf. But I don't see blind and deaf. I thought there was a reason behind that. I thought, I thought look, and couldn't buy one. I said, Jesus always, Jesus always make a way that we can get the word of God. He always gets a way, makes a way that we can hear and understand and receive the word of God. These blind men heard. Hmm. These blind men heard that Jesus was passing by. They heard that he was passing by. Notice what they did. See, see, this is an open confession of what they are saying. See, they recognize that Jesus who passing by, that he was Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. That he was the Messiah. They recognize that when they use the term son of David, they say, you are the Messiah, the chosen one. They recognize it. They recognize it. Hmm. They acknowledge him as having the authority and the power to heal them. That's something. Hmm. I wonder if we recognize that today and really act upon it and cry out. But it's funny. Let me think. It's funny that being in the right place at the right time. This is like location, location, location. Talk about real estate. You think about real estate. The, 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 it's all about location, 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 location. Here it is. These two men are on the side of the road when Jesus decides to come back. Coincidence? No. No coincidence? No. No. But it is interesting. We can talk about this in Bible study too. It is interesting that as I reach as I research through the scriptures, I find no indication of Jesus ever coming out or being in Jerusalem, being in Jericho, except this time right here. Being in Jericho. Here it is, he's in Jericho. Well, the first time that I see in Scripture, coming out of Jericho, headed to Jerusalem, where he's going to be crucified. Therefore, he would never, ever again go back to Jericho. Hmm, location. These blind men just happen to be sitting by? No, divine intervention. Jesus has never been there before, didn't go there since. 
And they just happen, they just happen to be there. Not happen. Divine dimension. So what does that say to us? Now's the time. Now is the acceptable time that we need to receive Christ as Lord and our Savior. We have no idea if we're going to pass by again. We have no idea if we're able to call on the name of the Lord again. Now is the time. Now is the time. We have no idea if we're going to have another opportunity. We need to cry out to Almighty God. Think about it. Think about your life. Look at our lives. Personally, look at your own life. Look at it. Look, 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 look at our, our nation. It's time to cry out. A nation that's founded on Christian or God's principle. Nation. In God we trust. Our constitution. Everything based on, on God. But now look at our nation. A nation that's really Say we have more Christians, 70, 80, 90 percent Christian, but yet what's happening to our nation? Two principles that God left for us. Very similar. That we as Christians love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. And, and then he said, also, the second one is likewise. Love your neighbor as yourself. Look at our nation. I see the part. I see the part that we love one another. I see the part that we love those that look like us. Go places where we are. Do the things we do. We love them. But our nation. Nation. We need to be crying out. We need to be crying out to God. To heal the nation. We say God can rebuild things. Even no matter what condition it is. God can rebuild our lives. God can rebuild our nation. But we need to cry out. God said, if my people who are called by my name, now I'll heal the land. We need to cry out. Listen what happens when you cry out, though. Verse 31 says, Then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet. But they cried out all the more. Multitude warned them to be quiet. In other words, they tried to shut them up. The crowd, the multitude, they, they wanted to be quiet. Be quiet. And, and, and I almost get the sense that they're really treating them like kids and say, shut up. Why are you talking? Why are you making all that noise? Be quiet. Cry it out. What is it you sing to me? When you're trying to get to Jesus, and you know it's Jesus, and you accepted him, and you know what you know that you know, that nobody can shut you up, nobody should be able to shut you up. Crowd can't shut you up. They tried to shut them up. They wouldn't lie to They cried even, even the more. And that's what we need to do. We need to cry even the more. Cry even more. The more. Try. Mm. Even the more. And even in verse 2 is saying, telling us, I mean in verse 32, it was really telling us how Jesus stopped in his tracks. And how he spoke to them. Mm. Here's a very interesting thing as I look at that. A group of people crying out to God. Two people, I should say. And a group of people trying to shut them up. They kept crying. But yet, I saw something that only if you open your eyes you see. Jesus is on a mission. He's on a mission to Jerusalem. Yet two men, two blind men, cried out to Jesus and stopped Jesus in his track. Stopped Jesus in his track. You said, they're not Pharisees, elders, bishops, doctors. No, they're two blind men. And they stopped Jesus in his track. Hmm. Strange? No, no, 
No, that's strange. Happens all the time when you look at it. When, when we become children of God, he becomes our father. He becomes our father. And our father hears us. So when God's children speak, he listens. When God's children speaks and touch him, he listens. Have you seen this before? Yeah. yeah. You, you remember there was another crowd of people that was around? There was a crowd of folks around and, 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 and Jesus all of a sudden said, who touched me? Who touched me? And everybody looked at Jesus like, what's wrong? There's a crowd of people here. Why are you asking who touched you? Who touched you? See, when God's children call out and touch Jesus, you get his attention. Two blind men got Jesus' attention. Stood still. Two blind men. Hmm. Is this strange? No, it's not strange. It's biblical. Think about what he said in the scripture. He said, why? 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 Why do you think your earthly father that's evil can do good things for you, but not your heavenly father? <laughs> See, really? I created your father. Yeah. So when, when his children call, he listens. We got his attention. As a matter of fact, we're the only ones to get his attention. His children get his attention. Hmm. He stood still. He stood still, and what he did, he says, he called them. In verse 32, he called them. And since we're dealing with questions, let me, let me ask you a couple of questions. Let me, let me ask you a couple of questions since we're dealing with questions. What are you going to do? What are you going to do when Jesus calls you? Not if, because he's going to call you. Not if he's going to call you, but when he's going to call you. What are you going to do? How are you going to respond to his call? Will you listen to what he has to say to you? And tell you to do what you do? Or, 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 or would you just stay in the condition that you're in? Stay in your condition and continue to cry out to Almighty God. When he's already trying to bring you out. Some of us, some of us, uh, some of us won't even answer. But we're going to listen to the crowd. Some of us won't answer, but we're going to listen to the crowd because we may feel that we are not adequate for the calling of the Almighty King. We may feel like the crowd knows all about us. The crowd knows what we're going through, what we've been through, and know that we're not worthy to be called by God. But here's something I want to tell you. Because the crowd does affect you and how you respond to Almighty God. See, the crowd, the crowd only knows what they see on the outside. When they look at me, they only know what they see on the outside. But they have no clue of what's going on on the inside. On the inside. Therefore, when God calls you, you must move. You must move. And it doesn't matter what the crowd say. We must come to him just the way we are. Too many of us want to clean ourselves up, but we can't clean ourselves up. We must come to him when he calls. Forget about the crowd. Forget about the noise around you. Move now. Two blind men heard, and the two blind men obeyed what God had called them to do. I can imagine. I can imagine Jesus speaking to them as he called them. He says, eh, I've heard you cry. I've heard you cry the first time you cry. I heard you cry. Just like I heard my, 
by my children, the Israelites, when they was in bondage. I, I heard their cry. I've heard it. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? I can hear him asking the question. It's interesting here, though. It's interesting that, that these blind men are really identified by their condition. They're blind. You identify them as blind men. I wonder, I wonder how we would feel if we were identified by the problem of our life. Our problem of our life. I wonder how would we feel if we were being identified by those issues. Blind men are the blind men are just like us. They have other issues in their life, problems in their life, just like we do. More issues than just the what you see on the outside of us being blind. See, there's problems that we have in our life that are seen by many. Then there's problems that's only known by a few. Then there's problems that only you want to know because you try to keep it a secret. See, those things that are known by many are those physical things that it's easy to see. I'm blind. I'm lame. I'm black. I'm white. You can see those things. And nothing I can do about it. Those things that are only known by a few is those things that you have shared with someone else. But then there's those things that you have kept secret that you don't want anybody to know. But it's interesting. God knows all about all of them. About all of them. And all of us have those issues. God knows about them. He knows about them. So Jesus still asks the question, so what do you, you want me to do for you? Which one of your many issues? Which one do you want me to do for you? See, maybe, maybe the physical one is maybe not the one that, that you want him to do. Maybe not. Is this a strange question to ask? What do you want me to do for you? No, no. This, this is a question I believe that God constantly asks us. Matter of fact, if you see in Scripture, he asks Solomon the same question. He asks him and says, what do you want me to give you? You name it. Name it. What do you want me to give you? He asks the question. And I think he's still asking the question today. What do you want me to do for you? Question. The question is at your ears. Now, I believe there's many reasons why he asked this question. One reason was, I think, for the surrounding people, for his disciples, for the crowd, and really for us today as we read the scripture. Just as much as he did it for the blind man. He wanted them to give him what they wanted him to do. Tell me. Tell everybody what you want him to do. Tell everybody. And what he said... And in, in, in verse 33 says that we want really our eyes to be open. Jesus already knew. Jesus already knew what they were going to ask. It wasn't for him, for them, for us, that we may know that God has the power to heal in the open eyesight. He has the power. See, they could have said whatever they wanted to say. And Jesus said, I got that too. Whatever you would have asked, he had the power and authority to do. So they asked the question that our eyes may be open. Now Jesus could have said to them, you already have 20-20. You already see. Your eyes are already open. You see things that people with eyesight can't see. You will recognize that I am the Messiah. And I have spiritual leaders around me that have no clue of what you just said. 
They follow me. But they don't know what you know. You have perfect eyesight. He could have said that to them. But no. God knew. He knew. He knew what they were asking. And he knew what they wanted. They wanted to physically see. So the scripture says in 34, so Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received light. Now, if you if you could really see, you 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 if you could really see, you would see that really God always had compassion on us. Not just these two blind men. He always had compassion on us. He came from royalty. King of kings, Lord of lords, took off his robe and came in the form of man for man to make fun of him, spit on him, beat him. For us? Compassion. Put him on a cross, pierce him in his side for us? And then he said, he said, Father, Father, forgive them. Although they know not what they do. That's compassion. He had compassion on them, just like he had compassion on all of us. And then he touched their eyes. Their request for their eyes may be open. I understand it. God didn't have to touch their eyes. He didn't have to do that. But he touched their eyes. Again, I believe for us. Question was asked. Or the request was made to touch their eyes. Notice what he did do. See when I go to the eye doctor, when I go to the eye doctor today, he put me on a machine, and I got to look through a machine and put some drops in my eyes and examine me and this and that. Thousands and thousands, or maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment that he examined my eyes and tell me, you need some glasses. Then let me give you some glasses that you can see. Now you can you see better like this or like this? Or maybe like this or like this. And then he gives you the right ones that you can see better. No, 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 no. Jesus said, touch their eyes, and their eyes was open. Normally. Normally, it takes a while for your eyes to open when you've been blind. You know, sometimes when you do miracles, you see a little bit. Then you see a little bit more and a little bit more. But no, it says immediately their eyes were open. So I decided to look up the word immediate. It says instantly. Instantly, without delay, their eyes was open. They could see. Jesus had that authority. He opened up their eyes and they could see. See, God is awesome. He answered their prayer. And you've answered our prayer. He answered our prayers also. Many of us have prayers been answered by God. And then it says, and they followed him. See, this is interesting right here. See, we, we need to we need to follow Jesus once he heals us. See, too many of us, when we get healed, get a blessing by God, we just don't have time for him anymore. Not until we get into the next situation. We need to take time to follow Jesus wherever he goes. Not only follow him, we need to do what he tells us to do wherever he tells us to go and say. These men two blind men, they followed him wherever he went. They followed him to Jerusalem. There was a testimony to what he had done in their lives. That's what we do. God tests, cure us, help us, guide us, direct us. And we give a testimony of what God can do for us. They was a witness. And I only can imagine, the scripture doesn't say, him, it, it, that, but I can imagine everywhere they went, they testified about Jesus. They followed. I believe even after Jesus was crucified, that they testified about Jesus. And really I believe, until God called them home, they testified about what Jesus did for them. They followed him. And not only in just 
follow him for something, but they bless other people on the way because God has done something for them. What do you what do you want? What do you want Jesus to do for you? What do you want Jesus to do for you? The question is that to you. Is it is it is it is it that that physical issue that you want him to do? Maybe. And it's okay. Could it be a spiritual issue that you want him to do something for you? Could be. Could it be? Could it be you want a blessing for someone else? Maybe you'll be like Saul and say, I want wisdom that I can govern your people. And the world could be blessed by it. Could. The question is waiting. What do you want Jesus to do for you? He is able. Let, let me, let me, let me leave you with two thoughts. See, I believe, I believe that the two men were blind. And I believe that Jesus gave him sight. But what I see here, what I see, maybe not reading this, but what I see is this blindness really is just an indication of whatever hinders us, or whatever keeps us from, or whatever we need God to do for us. He's able to do it. He said, whatever you, what you want me to do, you can do it. So I see whatever it is, Whatever it is, God is able to take care of that issue. With you. Second thing I like to leave you with: questions that Jesus asked, and He asked us many questions. I wonder why don't we ask Jesus a question? So Jesus, you blessed us so much for so many years. You have blessed us and led us and fed us and clothed us and sheltered us. You have done it all. Maybe we should ask Jesus this question. Jesus, Jesus, what do you want me to do for you? God's word. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Let us pray. Lord, Lord, may we hear your voice. Maybe even if we can't see, maybe we're in a dark place, but maybe we hear your voice. And not only may we hear your voice, Lord, but when we hear your voice, Lord, may we get up from where we are and come to you. And when we come to you, Lord, may we do what you call us to do. And we may be examples, followers of the Almighty God. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done. Thank you for these two blind men that wouldn't let the crowd shut them up. Wouldn't let anything stand in their way to get to Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. In Jesus' precious name I pray. May you bless all of your people. And may they answer the question that you placed before them. What do you want me to do for you? God's word. Amen. Amen. Let the church say amen. Church say Amen. And today, today, I hope you got something out of that message. How it moves you in some form or fashion. We're going to also have our communion. I told you earlier to get your communion together. And as a family, our communion, as we break bread together, Jesus said, told us to do this in remembrance of him until we come again. So he come back again to he was do this in remembrance of him 
and he wouldn't eat with us until it's new and heaven with him. So let's break the bread and let us partake of the bread as representing his body. And also his blood. The wine that represents the blood of Jesus. Let us drink it together. And we thank God for all that He's done, all that He's going to do. And they went out singing and praising God for all that He had done. And now we need to. In our homes, in our job, wherever we may be, that we need to praise God and give Him glory and honor for all He's done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll see you next week. God's willing. What a new question that God has to ask us. Amen. Amen. That's not how the story is.